Listo, ya estamos en vivo. Okay, uh, welcome to everyone to the, the colloquio of the Institute of Physics. So let me, it's really a pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Widmer from the University of Notre Dame at Indiana, USA. Uh, Professor Widmer made his PhD at the University of Illinois in Urbana Campaign, Champaign. Uh, his research interest includes soft matter physics, colloidal physics, liquid crystals, among others. And he's uh, principally interested in computational physics and its applications to material science and so on. Uh, nowadays, he has published more than 50 research pa papers with more than 2,000 citations. So be prepared to hear a wonderful researcher, a nice collaborator, and a good friend. Yeah, Welcome, John, and feel free to start with your lecture. Gracias, Pedro, por la invitación. Uh, I would love to give this, uh, this talk uh, fully in Spanish. That is something that has been a goal of mine since the first time I visited San Luis. That's almost six, seven years ago now. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, COVID hit. Uh, I had a lack of speaking partners and my, my, uh, my Spanish got a little bit uh, rusty. Um, so I will be giving this talk in English and hopefully I'll be able to, uh, to communicate this uh, as clearly as possible. And please, if, if there are any questions, let me know. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Pedro. Um, as Pedro mentioned, he's, he's a good collaborator and a good friend. He's visited here um, in the past and, and we've had very many productive conversations uh, and have a few projects ongoing uh, and have for the past several years where we uh, combine some of the uh, continuum knowledge that his group works on with some of the uh, atomistic simulations we work on. So as Pedro mentioned, um, I, uh, I am a physicist. And uh, despite the fact that my uh, departmental affiliation is chemical and biomolecular engineering, uh, my interests are in physics, computational physics, soft matter physics, materials physics, um, and materials properties. And, Maybe begrudgingly, I'm edging a little bit more toward uh, physical chemistry and the applications thereof to chemical engineering processes, uh, because that's a fertile ground with a lot of, uh, of potential for collaboration with people around me. Uh, but today I'm gonna talk primarily about uh, a set of systems that we have been interested in over the past few years that involve the transport of ions in a liquid crystalline structure. These are ionic liquid materials, but they are also liquid crystalline. And that combination of charged nature and uh, inherent mesoscopic structure enables some really interesting phenomena that we're hoping to exploit in, uh, in new technologies. So before I begin, I think it's very important to thank all of the people that really do need to be thanked. Uh, lest I run out of time and not be able to do so at the end. Uh, this is a picture of my current group and the people who have done the bulk of the work that I will be presenting today are uh, Marvin Diaz-Segura, uh, who came to us from uh, uh, Autonoma Metropolitana, uh, and Logan Hennis, who is a first year graduate student in my group, uh, Michael Covillian, uh, a recent PhD of my group, who graduated, oh, just about a year and a half ago, about 18 months. Uh, and he laid a, a huge amount of the groundwork for the results I'm going to talk about today. Time permitting, although when I practiced this talk, it was much longer. And so I've, I've uh, probably cut, going to cut the material. But time permitting, I'll present some also exciting recent work uh, from graduate student Ramon Gantarez, who uh, did a uh, uh, undergraduate and master's at University of Guanajuato. Uh, and has uh, done a lot of great work recently on the study of lithium transport and lithium binding uh, in uh, polymer-based membranes. And there is a, a, a huge wealth of information. I could probably pull together uh, two separate colloquia from this and, uh, and other results uh, that, that are ancillary to it and help us explain it. Uh, I'd be remiss not to point out the funding Primarily funding for this comes from uh, National Science Foundation, 
uh, through uh, funding of the um, the Division of Materials Research that uh, provided me with a career award to study colloidal properties and some things about transport. Uh, Marvin Diaz Segura is uh, supported by a Department of Education Fellowship. We've had some in additional funding from Procter and Gamble, and funding to develop molecular uh, molecular dynamics algorithms, molecular sampling algorithms, and, and other sort of simulation related things uh, is provided by the Department of Energy. So there's a huge host of people to thank overall, not only my current group, but all, all those in the past. And in particular, uh, I'm going to talk about work today uh, that involved uh, collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Jennifer Shaver, who's here at uh, Notre Dame, and Professor Pedro Ramirez, who uh, gave me the glowing introduction. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll go from here. Before we focus on the specific study, I think it's really important to point out some of the breadth of the things that we study. Uh, first and foremost, my group is a computational physics group. My uh, interests are in understanding and elucidating new behaviors in primarily in materials, but also in self-assembling systems, binding systems, et cetera. And we've done a lot of uh, work over the past, doing the math, roughly nine years that I've been at Notre Dame, where we had developed new sampling algorithms capable of extracting free energies. The important thing about free energies, rather than the more readily available thermodynamic averages and energies that are in um, typical molecular simulations, is that free energies codify all of the important material properties. If we know which directions or which uh, deformations or which coordinates to uh, define a system with, and we can measure the free energy in those, we can develop the expansion relations that will give us response coefficients that determine transport, that determine uh, material response. Um, in liquid crystals, and I'll talk a little bit more about liquid crystals in general if you're less uh, familiar with them, we can develop ideas that enable us to probe elasticity and measure and explore novel elasticity in different types of shaped liquid crystals. But we can also do things that are, are far more fundamental and look at, for example, binding free energies between a host and guest complex that are both solvated in water. This is a picture of a, a diamino xylene bound to cucurbitril 7. Um, cucurbitril 7 is kind of a fun molecule because of its name. Uh, it comes from the Latin for pumpkin. So if you look at them side on, they look a bit like a pumpkin that's had the top and the bottom cut off. And those are interesting molecules for solvating non-solvatable uh, objects in, in water. So things that are organic, but have a little bit of a polar component can be bound in this cavity and shielded uh, more or less from the aqueous environment. We look at uh, calculating these free energies as a way to determine the properties of materials that can be derived from them, but it also determines chemical kinetic behavior if you're using this in say a drug delivery application. Uh, a good amount of our work in the recent past has looked at the self-assembly of colloidal clusters and more recently uh, atomic clusters using coarse grain force fields all the way to ab initio force fields and exploring the role that entropy has to play as measured through the free energy in determining the stability of different cluster formations. We've looked at the behavior of um, ions transporting through a polymer membrane, uh, a restricted region between two uh, aqueous solutions, and how functionalizing that by placing polymers on the inside, changing their charge, changing their interactions with the ions in the surrounding area, can have important effects on the ability of these membranes to permit solvent to flow through, but not solute. And those are really interesting applications that kind of bend what we do a bit more toward chemical engineering, uh, but, uh, but are rooted in fundamental 
physics and fundamental physical chemistry. We've additionally done a large amount of work recently studying the behavior of polyelectrolytes, both weak polyelectrolytes that are influenced by pH, such as the one undergoing a coil globule transition here upon charging, but also uh, strong polyelectrolytes that will complex influenced by the salt in the environment and uh, the solute. If there's a single unifying message of these things, it's that similar tools can be useful to attack a wide variety of different systems, and I'm interested in nearly all of them. So specifically on the uh, topic of liquid crystals, I think it's necessary before talking about what makes ionic liquid crystals uh, unique to talk a bit about the base understanding of liquid crystalline materials. And the most common understanding of a liquid crystal comes from these. Yes. Oh. Sorry, I, I was sorry, hearing something. Sorry, please, uh, Tonio, please turn up your, your, your microphone. Okay. I thought there was a question. I, uh, I apologize for, for pausing. Um, back, back into, uh, the idea of liquid crystals comes from these um, prolate ellipsoidal objects uh, that take what we think of as the simplest phases of matter, the vapor, the liquid, and the solid that arise when we have isotropically interacting objects and split these phases into things that have varying degrees of orientational and positional order. The simplest thing one can do is change one axis in three dimensions of this molecule, creating either a, a prolate or an oblate, oblate uh, ellipsoid. Uh, and if you create a prolate ellipsoid, this liquid region uh, transitions into three different possibilities based on the length of the, the ellipsoid and the interactions it has with other materials. It can be either isotropic with no orientational dependence. It can be pneumatic with no positional dependence, but some orientational uh, dependence. And it can be smectic, which has one direction of positional order along with uh, an orientational order. There are different flavors of smectic that can exist based on how those things interact or align inside the plane. The simplest being the smectic A, where the plane of the uh, layers is aligned with the uh, director or the orientation of the molecules. This can even be further split on top of that. In this particular uh, example, we pick out what is the pneumatic phase, and we see that if there is a chiral interaction, we can turn this into something that will have new uh, phases possible on top of it when the chiral interaction takes over that are not just pneumatic, but also have a chiral element. That creates uh, the uh, cholesteric phase. And depending on the degree of twisting uh, that results from the chiral interaction, you can obtain liquid crystalline phases such as blue phase one and two uh, before it transitions to smectics twist green boundaries, et cetera. There is a huge amount of possibility and variability in these systems. Just to quantify a little bit how pneumatic order is calculated, because it will come in handy uh, later in the talk to, to have discussed this. The isotropic phase is one in which we have no order. And the pneumatic phase is one in which we have some overall director. That director should not have a preferred orientation in the sense that, its head and its tail should be equally likely to be aligned with. It's a headless vector. And you can construct a tensor with a scalar uh, primary eigenvalue that will select out this vector, either plus or minus, headless, uh, according to this construction, where we do a uh, ensemble average over the orientations of all of the individual molecules, so if I attach a vector to each of these individual molecules showing the orientation, then I can average over these, create this tensor, and I have a, as the primary eigenvalue, 
this value S between minus one half and one, which is zero in the isotropic phase, but grows increasingly as the, um, as the system becomes more and more orientationally ordered. Typically for a pneumatic, the value of S is somewhere on the order of 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. Okay. It can also, depending on the character of the mesogens, develop biaxiality and the biaxial uh, eigenvalue uh, or the biaxial component of the eigenvalue eta determines the degree of this. If there is no biaxiality, this is just minus s over two twice. But if there is some, it will pick out a preferred direction with a positive and negative splitting of this eigenvalue. The smectic order is going to be very important for the things we talk about in ionic liquid crystals. And so it's useful to go uh, into depth a little bit more about what it is. I really uh, think that knowing the origin of words, uh, especially words in science, can be powerful in their interpretation. Uh, and I recall from uh, De Gen's book, I believe, hopefully that's not an apocryphal quote, uh, that the uh, smectic name comes from the Greek for soap. They are soap-like in that they have sort of a layering that will occur in them, even though they are, they are liquid-like. So if you think about what a sort of close packed version of these uh, ellipsoidal particles would be forming into a crystal. We'd have some hexagonal ordering within the planes. We have very well registered layers normal to the planes. Um, and if we melt within that layer while preserving this layering, that's what we have when we have a smectic. Within this plane, it is liquid-like. So you can see in the directions that are within the plane, there is no translational order. There is only the orientational order and then the layering in one direction. What's really interesting about this is that not only occurs in these ellipsoidal particles, but it also occurs in systems of surfactant molecules. If you assemble surfactants in, for example, water, but really any, any solute or solvent, excuse me, that can uh, permit a surfactant-like interaction. The first thing you'll have is just free dissolved molecules. And as you get to the critical micelle concentration, you'll end up with micelles that will grow into rods eventually as you increase this concentration and become hexagonal phases and then lamellar phases. It's these lamellar phases that are directly analogous to the smectic phases. And while there can be some solvent in between lamellar layers, there is not necessarily, there's not needed to be in order to get this sort of ordering. So this idea of a lamellar phase in surfactant and a smectic in these liquid crystals gives you an idea of what kind of ordering uh, we will be observing in these systems. So what kind of applications do people envision for liquid crystals in general? So liquid crystals have uh, several applications in the form of responsive solids and some uh, uh, great examples I think of are these uh, artificial muscles that can be created by taking a polymer matrix that has been, um, that has been cross-linked around a liquid crystalline material uh, and heating it so that the rubber network that is there will contract because it would prefer to contract. But as the system is cooled, as that light is removed and the system is allowed to cool, it will then eventually begin to elongate again as the orientation of the liquid crystals takes hold. As we lower that temperature and it becomes uh, pneumatic again, what will happen is this will stretch and it will lower the weight, right? So heating it a little bit raises the weight, cooling it lowers the weight, these act very much like, uh, like muscular systems and are responsive. We can look at uh, liquid crystal based sensors, whether in the uh, pneumatic state or in the smectic state, depending on what kind of sensitivity we would like, by playing surface interactions of a liquid crystal droplet against the bulk interactions uh, defined by the elasticity of the liquid crystals, we can get very uh, large optical responses in these materials. And that can be used to sense wanted compounds, unwanted compounds, 
levels of, of different things in a, a system. It's a very useful technology with uh, an extremely high potential for sensitive uh, response. One of the other things that I, I'm, I'm interested in uh, very much because of my dual interests, not only in liquid crystals, but also in the self-assembly of colloids, is how they can be used to tune interactions based on the defects that they generate between uh, colloids of various shapes and various surface functionalities. And by changing the properties of the pneumatic, changing the properties of the smectic, you can get different uh, equilibrium arrangements of these particles that have a very strong and stable uh, character. Okay. So where do the ionic liquid portions of this come in? I've done all the talk so far about sort of generic soft matter uh, and about liquid crystals, but where do ionic liquids come into this? Ionic liquids in principle are something that, um, are something that, that it is what it says it is. I, I try to think of a simple way to explain it, but an ionic liquid is an ionic liquid. If you have a salt that due to various reasons is a liquid, then it behaves as an ionic liquid. Now that could mean something that is a molten salt, such as sodium chloride that has been heated above its melting point, or it could be something that is a room temperature ionic liquid. And this is the thing that most uh, chemical engineers, in particular many uh, in my department, uh, close friends and collaborators, think of as ionic liquids, which are larger types of ions, things that have limited uh, ability for packing, limited uh, and, and, uh, and frustrated uh, packings that arise. And so instead of crystallizing, despite strong ionic interactions, they will stay liquid at room temperature. And one of the benefits of this is that these things have a very uh, low vapor pressure, so it can make them a good solvent because they tend to have charged domains, but also contain some organic-like uh, organic -like groups that are able to solvate a large number of different uh, molecules. They can also draw in specific molecules such as carbon dioxide that have quadrupolar character that may not dissolve in other solvents because they're not truly polar, but they do have a charge distribution that can be exploited by certain types of arrangements. And so I mentioned my good colleagues, uh, uh, Ed McGinn, who's about three doors down from me, uh, is an expert in ionic liquids and has studied extensively through computational methods, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration uh, into ionic liquids. The application we're most interested in, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when we, we discuss the structure, is as a battery electrolyte where the duality of the liquid crystal can be uh, exploited, where we get a solid-like response in some dimensions from the fact that it is partially organized, but we can also get connected domains of charge. Ionic liquid crystal phases are almost as numerous as there are ionic liquid crystal molecules. And there is a significant amount of uh, debate about what the equilibrium is in different cases. It turns out that based on the ion structure and also on the, the type of tail group you get, you can have either things that mimic very well the smectic ideal look very much like the lamellar phase that we talked about uh, a couple of slides back, uh, minus the solvent. Or you can get uh, objects that will arrange more like my cells. They, they will crystallize into layers, but due to the, the interactions of the tail groups and the charges, prefer not to form into full layers. It's important for us to find materials for the applications we're interested in that have a, a unique smectic-like character and can permit the, um, the transport of charge in the charged uh, layers. So the target application of this is informed by some recent work that has been done in um, uh, disensitized solar cells and in block copolymer electrolytes where some degree of mesophase ordering, so structural ordering, couples with the solvation of ions 
or the presence of ions as part of that phase to enable charge transport in different domains. The idea here being that if we can form a smectic, so something that has a good nanostructure and forms into layers, and the ion layers here are depicted from this, uh, this, this view graph as the red lines, that provides a path through the material for ion transport. In some instances, we may be interested in transport of electrons as well. Electronic conduction uh, could be an important, uh, an important part of that medium. In some cases, such as batteries, we are primarily interested in conduction of ions, uh, such as lithium that are taking part in the um, electrochemical process. These ILC materials provide sort of a very small scale approximation to the same types of behaviors you get in block copolymers where there is a rigid non-solvating matrix that is used to impart structural uh, stability to the material, but also an ion solvating portion where this is uh, viewed as the, the red and blue patches denoting the lithium's presence in that. Uh, that provides a domain for ion conduction, hopefully primarily of the cations in the process. There is some expectation that smectic layering can enhance ion transport. So this study looked at uh, the transport of uh, protons. So not quite as complicated, maybe more complicated, depending on how you think about it. Uh, as the uh, lithium ions uh, that are typically of interest in batteries, but nonetheless something that uh, is, is of interest to conduct through a given medium. And this uh, liquid crystal-based sulfonic acid uh, moiety with a, a long alkyl tail and the, the sulfonic acid on the, on the head group was looked at in a powder form in a smectic phase and in its molten phase. And the important figure of merit here is the conductivity measured here in Siemens per centimeter. A good uh, conductivity is something on the order of 10 to the minus third, 10 to the minus second is really great. That would enable uh, fast transport and charging of ions in a battery. And in this case, what, what, we would, what we look at is that in the solid, there's effectively no conduction. There's a very small amount of charge that can hop between different locations, but that it's largely insensitive to temperature uh, and the powdered structure uh, does not really permit the, uh, the transport of these, uh, these protons. Now, when that gets melted into a smectic A, we see two different signatures. The first being very similar to what's seen in the solid powder and the second being much higher conductivity. Finally, when it's heated enough, we free up uh, the, the head groups and the molten version of this smectic uh, ends up having a higher conductivity around 10 to the minus fourth. So what's the key difference between these two? Why does one conduct well and one not conduct well? Well, as noted in this, this paper here, what happens is, in this lower version, the smectic has not been prepared to align the smectic domain. So what we get is grains of smectic that will conduct some charge in among the, the layers, but will not conduct completely across the material. When that's rectified, the layers greatly enhance the, uh, the transport of protons in this material. And this would be a real game changer in the context of lithium ion electrolytes, because as noted, it would enable sort of fast charging and discharging uh, alongside uh, the, uh, the structural stability uh, and potentially uh, increased transference number uh, of, the, um, of the lithium in the electrolyte. We also have some theoretical motivation for, for studying these things. And I, when Pedro invited me, I knew I was going to have to have a little bit of information from this work by uh, his uh, graduate student, uh, Mariana uh, Farias, uh, and my former postdoc and, and Magdalena's former student, uh, Ernesto Cortez. It, um, 
it was a study that was done using a self-consistent generalized Langevin equation that looked at things that were like ionic liquid crystals. In particular, we modeled the size ratio of these on the liquid crystals I'm going to show you that we studied atomistically via molecular simulation on the next slide. And we considered this to be a, a spherical cow uh, ionic liquid. So it's a sphere, it's reasonably rigid, and it's completely rigid. Uh, there's a 10 to one size ratio between the large and the small ions, and there's a one to one charge ratio. And one of them is going to be positive, one of them is going to be negative. It's kind of irrelevant which for the equations as they are. This is one of the beautiful things about physics is we could flip the, the charges uh, as we want to, to describe either a system that would conduct positively charged ions or negatively charged ions, depending on which we would be interested in. And the take home from this is that we have an arrest diagram that predicts, depending on the loading fraction, we can have either a glass of the small particles in a fluid of large particles, or we can have a system that has a glass of the large particles with a fluid of small particles. This means that we can decouple the motion of the two ions strictly by the differences in their size. And hopefully also, as we examine this, the differences in their liquid crystalline structure. And that that could be something very useful for enhancing the efficiency uh, of battery technologies. So the system that we studied uh, atomistically is, is this one depicted here. Uh, in the group, we called it CN-MIM. Uh, the MIM is methyl imidazolium. So there's a methyl group here, imidazolium ion, and then the CN group that's grown off of the, uh, the end of the, um, the imidazole ion. And the counter ion in this case uh, is a nitrate ion. And one might think that this is a very complicated place to start. And I think it is. Um, if it were not for the fact that this had been previously studied in uh, molecular simulations as we were coming to this and we wanted some published results to compare to, we might have started with something simpler or even completely coarse grained, uh, such as some of the re results I'll show you uh, near the end of this talk. But nevertheless, we started here and we started here with uh, with this, uh, this material and, and explored it because it had been relatively extensively characterized both in simulation, coarse grained and atomistic and in experiments. Typically the ionic liquid before it becomes a, um, a ionic liquid crystal has approximately a maximum of eight carbon atoms in the tail. Uh, my colleagues down the hall will typically stop at studying, say, an octyl uh, methyl imidazolium, so a, a C8 that is attached to it. However, once you get beyond C12 into C14, you start to see both experimentally and in, in simulations, a ordered smectic phase that is thermodynamically stable up here. Uh, and we'll talk more about that on the next couple of slides. We base our force field on this work by Samba Vissaro, uh, and Acevedo that built OPLS AA force field. So OPLS is optimized potential for liquid simulations. AA means all atom. Uh, that built an OPLS AA based model for ionic liquid species that was transferable to any number of carbons in the tail uh, and uh, specific anions uh, that could easily be easily be generalized for uh, the study that we're going to have. And we use this standard functional along with their fitting parameters to build this with a generalized uh, uh, methyl imidazolium and CN cation. The one important feature that we added to this that was not in the base OPLS AA model is a charge scaling of 0.8. This is something that's commonly done in studies of uh, ionic liquids, uh, particularly atomistic simulations of ionic liquids, because it accounts for a couple of different features that are there, but are not typically in a molecular simulation. The first is there can often be partial charge transference between the ionic liquids, depending on what the, the species are. Maybe there's some proton transfer, maybe there's some other things that can actually effectively 
in a statistical mechanics sense, reduce the overall charge of that moiety. But something that's far more prevalent in these materials is that they actually are not necessarily non-unitary in charge or even on average non-unitary in charge, but they do have some kind of polarization. So why they have a net charge of one, um, the typical molecular simulation is going to regard electrostatics in a vacuum behind there. If there's no added dielectric constant, if it's a typical all atom simulation, there is no polarizability. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but there is no polarizability. And that lack of polarizability means that you don't get the effects from the screening, partial screening of charge interactions due to polarization effects. The typical, uh, the typical um, organic molecule has a dielectric constant on the order of two. If we translate that to the Coulomb interaction, it gives us a charge scaling of around 0.8. It's a bit hand-waving, but not too bad. I think as a physicist, I, have, I find comfort in the fact that I can justify where that number comes from. This change has important consequences in improving the enthalpy of vaporization measurement, surface tension, self-diffusion, and it is commonly applied okay, throughout these. We perform our, our simulations as constant pressure dynamics simulations with a one femtosecond time step and semi-isotropic conditions, just to, to get an idea for how the scheme is done. So you know what the approach to equilibrium is in this system. We begin with an equilibrated configuration or at least a prepared configuration at 300 Kelvin. So around room temperature, normal room temperature. And we increase uh, the uh, temperature in steps. So from this initial simulation, we propagate for approximately 20 nanoseconds. Then we break off that configuration. We randomize the velocities according to the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And one of those becomes an equilibration run that will eventually reach out to 300 nanoseconds, the last 100 or 200, depending on thermodynamic stability, depending on the approach to equilibrium, will be used for, <clears throat> for gathering data. And the other track then becomes uh, a, 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 the seed for a simulation that's 25 degrees hotter or 25 Kelvin hotter. We do this until we have a range of simulations between three and 600 Kelvin, starting from the crystal phase and eventually melting into the quasi-isotropic phase. So the observed mesophases we have are, are very instructive for what's going on here. So we place something that looks a bit like a simple cubic crystal at the outset. We let it stretch, we let it relax, we let it anneal a little bit, and it becomes something that is very strongly layered with very strongly ordered tails, and it has a bit of a tilted character to it. Okay? We, we end up with a little bit of, uh, of uh, tilting uh, in the, in the order of the, the crystals, we end up also with a little bit of, um, with a little bit of, of close packing almost within the, within the layers. As we heat that, it will go through a transition where these tail groups start to explore a little bit more. Their adhesion is not as strong. Their ordering is not as strong. They're not as tightly packed. They want to coil up a little bit. And that requires entropy. That requires space. And that separates the layers. And you can see the disorder in these, but still the strong Coulomb ordering in the layer that creates the smectic phase. At high enough temperatures, we get an isotropic phase, or at least it, it's mostly isotropic. We cannot uh, pick out strong positional order, although there does seem to be a micelle-like character about the, uh, the uh, arrangement of molecules in here, where the ions are strongly associative, and then the tail groups have, have slightly uh, uh, less defined interactions. Okay. So structurally, we can capture the, the behavior here and capture what kind of transition is occurring based on this Q tensor as noted, but also based on the, um, based on the, the pneumatic order parameter. And as a function of temperature, we see that uh, taking C12 as an example, we will start with an order parameter up near one in the largely crystalline state and then we'll undergo a precipitous drop once we reach about 425, 
uh, in into a maybe metastable smectic uh, and eventually an isotropic phase. As we go into the C14 and C16, we have a much broader region where there is a finite S that characterizes the smectic as opposed to the crystal, uh, and then uh, transition to uh, isotropic phases beyond that. Thermodynamically, if we look at signatures such as the molar volume per ion pair, or the enthalpy, molar enthalpy per ion pair, we see that this crystal to smectic or crystal to isotropic transition is very well captured in this thermodynamic data. We aren't able to see the transitions that happen at higher temperatures in it because there's a lot less of a, uh, a difference between the, quote, isotropic phase and the, uh, the smectic phase. There is going to be some difference in the energies uh, because of the way molecules are arranged, because of the different interactions that occur, but it's not uh, a significantly different amount uh, that, that jumps in, in terms of the volume per ion pair or in terms of the enthalpy per ion pair in the same way that uh, we see for um, the solid to smectic transition. The latent heat, for instance, is not really noticeable uh, in these uh, simulations. Uh, we can characterize the phase transition temperatures uh, as a function of uh, where, where they were observed and compare these OPLS AA results two experimental results uh, that come from Hewlett and uh, to some uh, other uh, simulation results that come from uh, Giacomo Saelli's group. Uh, and we find that these all atom force fields tend to overestimate the transitions. Now, ours does not quite overestimate as much as Saelli's do, but in our case, we use the scale charge to slightly better represent the uh, thermodynamics of the ion association. And Sayeli's work does not, does not use that. We are able to uh, capture a lot of the salient features, but it's pretty clear that uh, our, uh, our material is a bit too stable in both the smectic uh, and the crystalline phases. Uh, and some work should go into trying to better understand what interactions give rise to the proper thermodynamic behavior. Before we look too much at that, uh, one other thing to grab out of this set of simulations is some dynamic properties regarding the uh, mean square displacement and the radial distribution function uh, of the material. So here on the left, in these four panels, we have the mean square displacement of ions in this uh, system plotted as a function of time, okay, in nanoseconds. So it's it's determined by the length of simulation we have. For 400K, for 450K uh, in B, for 500K and for 600. So the important thing here is, this is the crystalline phase in A. This is still the crystalline phase, but just about to transition in B. This is in the smectic phase in C, and this is the isotropic in D. And we see a very strong signature of what phase we are in based on the mobility of ions. If we are in the crystalline phase, nothing moves. As we heat this toward the smectic phase, we start to get a little uptick in the movement of the microions, the nitrates here, but the larger ions are essentially unmoved. As we increase the temperature further, what we see is a big separation in the smectic phase between the dynamics of the ions, the, the nitrate anions, uh, excuse me, yes, the nitrate anions and uh, the uh, CN mim cations. And when we have the isotropic phase, they're essentially moving at the same rate as a group. Uh, some indication of what's going on can be understood by looking at the overall structure of the C14 mim cations and the head group and anion. Um, contributions. So this is a planar radial distribution function, meaning a peak is observed if another ion is viewed in the direction of the plane. So this is the xy direction as being located at this distance away from the original molecule. The C14 is based on the center of mass. This imidazolium here is based on the head group. Head groups are a little bit more mobile, a little bit more disordered actually uh, than the groups overall. But we see a strong ordering really in the, the center of mass in the ion in the crystal phase 
and in both ions in part A. As we get toward the smectic, we have less order, although still a, a good amount of order in the ions, but it's spread out a little bit indicating there is some mobility. While we still have a very uh, strong degree of ordering among the centers of mass of the molecules uh, with the aliphatic tails intact. As we go to uh, uh, the higher uh, temperatures in the smectic phase, we still see fairly strong ordering overall, a good bit of liquid like order for the, uh, excuse me, a good bit of liquid like order for all three of these. Uh, and uh, some very strong ion pairing as indicated by, by this dashed line uh, that's indicative of the increased mobility. And finally, uh, in this phase, we lose the degrees of ion pairing and the, uh, the extended order uh, inherent in liquid-like structure as we melt to the, um, the isotropic phase. To zero in on this a little bit more, check my time, uh, we decided to do some replica exchange simulations. And uh, without going into too much detail, the basic idea of replica exchange is that we can approach uh, a certain position from above and below and be able to grab the, um, be able to uh, grab configurations from one and see how likely they are to be within the ensemble of another image. That means if we have a, an array of temperatures, we will be able to swiftly equilibrate and figure out at what temperatures we should be observing liquid-like states versus solid-like states and pinpoint the area of a phase transition. This is what's done in, in this graph here for uh, a, a, a array of C uh, and MIMS from C10 through C20. And we find that our initial uh, 25 uh, degree sweeps are narrowed, and we find between uh, the points of phase transition previously, usually about a two to three degree window over which we have refined the, um, the knowledge of where that transition is. We can look a little bit more at the pneumatic order parameter over the whole temperature range in these systems. And in particular, we can focus on the transition with replica exchange. And we see in these systems, we have this indication there might be a bit of a metastable uh, smectic-like state uh, in even the shortest uh, CN MIMS we looked at. And that does seem to actually be relatively stable over a few degree window when we look at this with the replica exchange molecular dynamics. So I'm running a little bit low on time, but I want to talk about a couple of other improvements and a couple of other things that we have been doing to get a better handle on the behavior of the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, to get a better handle on the behavior of the system. And the important thing uh, about this is that we made some choices pragmatically to be able to understand something about these anequipal crystals and be able to capture their charge transport behavior, some novel charge transport behavior decoupling the cations and anions, uh, and to understand their structure. And now we want to get the thermodynamics right. We want to get the, the phase behavior a little better with the idea that that will also give us better control over and better understanding of ion dynamics in the phase. So we need something that has extra terms in it to account for this polarization uh, that is currently being hand-waved in, okay? maybe a little better than hand-waved in, by this factor of 0 0.8. What's important beyond this is that we can do this with the uh, amoeba force field, which includes uh, multipole moments and explicit polarization interactions, we use the, uh, the, the Tinker and Pole Type 2 um, uh, software that's from the Ren and Ponder uh, groups and use this to parameterize a similar all atom model to what we had before, but now it has explicit multi multiple moments and polarization. The take home of this is that all of our transition temperatures shift significantly downward. So, we were able to run this for only a fraction of the time that we were able to run the all atom classical force field simulation. And that means that we probably aren't quite at equilibrium. These are preliminary results. We're still trying to, to, to ascertain where that is. 
However, we know that all of the transition temperatures have been shifted down significantly, and we're getting transitions that are on the order of the experimental values uh, within you know, 20 to 40 K of them typically, uh, instead of 100 to 150 K off, which is quite great. And that's, that's depicted in this, uh, in this image right here, but more graphically, we can show that our percent differences in terms of the crystal smectic are down to 10% or 20% or so versus this nearly 40%, about 150K that is observed in the, um, in the uh, all atom simulations. The smectic isotropic transition is still a bit farther off, uh, but this may have to do with stability of the smectic phase and slow dynamics in breaking up the uh, character of a polarizable force field means we can only simulate it for uh, a fraction of the amount of time and so more data needs to be gathered to understand uh, when it works and does not but at worst it is seen to be on the order of the same uh, transition temperature meaning we'll probably get some improvement here too with better sampling now I want to move on briefly to new stuff that we've been working on in conjunction with the Schaefer group, which takes that, uh, that model with the methyl and mesoleum nitrate and starts looking at a lithium transporting ionic liquid crystal that will be useful in batteries. The LIC18 TFSI has a, a TFSI derived head group. So TFSI is a type of ion that is normally uh, solvated with lithium in, in battery electrolytes. And then it has the same kind of alkyl tail C18 here. It's been experimentally characterized in terms of its phase transition, transitions by the Schaefer group. Uh, and importantly, we've begun simulating these things and understanding its structure and phase behavior with all atom simulations. We perform these in Gromax using 512 ion pairs, similar to the previous. Uh, between 250 and 300K, although most of the simulations we have good data for are on the lower end because, and I can answer questions off offline about this, it's a very difficult thing to get simulated. It took us a very long time to get things to work and to develop a protocol that would reliably get these uh, into a, a solid-like state so that we begin to do the thermal annealing protocol. Uh, if we look at the structural features, mind you, these are at a much lower temperature than the experiments are at. Uh, we see that the, the layer spacings are a bit comparable, but we expect that these will probably spread out a little bit as uh, the tail groups uh, melt and, uh, and the layering, uh, in, uh, layering is allowed, or, and these aliphatic tails are, are allowed to uh, explore some more entropy. They will probably spread out in the x y directions and shorten up a little bit uh, coming more in a line with what's observed in experiments and we're able to show that looking at at the top we have an image at, at 250 kelvin the bottom we have the next temperature up in our temperature ramp which is 260. we start to see a little bit of the layering uh dissolve uh, or not dissolve but but uh um disorder uh, and we start to see that our ions get a little bit more mobile. So over the next few weeks, uh, I anticipate some pretty fast progress understanding the dynamics and structure of lithium within these phases. Looking ahead, uh, even these all atom versions of, of the force field, the classical all atom force fields, are not ideal places to do engineering and to design new materials because there is a lot of complexity. The all atom uh, simulations are tractable, but relatively slow if we want to try many different chemistries or many different flavors of chemistries. The uh, polarizable force fields are accurate, but slow and probably cannot be used to try many different flavors of chemistries, only refine our knowledge of the ones that do exist. So we're looking at developing a coarse grain model that looks at the cations, as these uh, Kramer Gress chains with uh, an ionic group on one end, and that tunes the stiffness of the backbone and allows us to explore the phase behavior of these materials in terms of temperature, in terms of pressure, in terms of solvent and salt content in a way that will enable us to do engineering and perhaps feed into 
uh, machine learning algorithms that can help us to develop a new material and predict what real world molecules can be made that mimic the interactions in our systems. With that, I will close. I would like to uh, draw particular attention, as I said, to the work of Marvin Diaz Segura, uh, Logan Hennis, and, um, and Michael Crovillian. Uh, and thank you for your attention uh, and, uh, and your time. And uh, thank you for my funding agencies, and I will accept any questions. Great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we will start with the questions here from the people who, uh, which is uh, connected by Zoom. And the people who are watching by YouTube, please uh, write the, the, the questions in the chat, and I will share here with John all your questions. So please, the people who, who have questions here, since, here in Zoom, um, someone want to, to, to ask something? Okay, I have a couple of questions. So first, uh, regarding the first, uh, the first um, system that have you you, you presented, mm -hmm. uh, if you decrease the temperature, you you can observe uh, the sp a spontaneous formation of these other phases, or are so difficult? Because uh, uh, as I understood, understood <laughs> you prepare the system in the, in the mm -hmm. other phase, and then yeah. you increase the temperature, right? So if yeah. you go in the opposite directions, it's easy to, to find these, these phases? So this is, this is a very big challenge, and you're asking a very insightful question, uh, uh, the question of someone who simulated something like this before. What we tend to get if we try to assemble this the opposite way, if we place this as sort of a randomized fluid and explore what we will get as it assembles, we can get a smectic to form. It's difficult to equilibrate it properly because it tends to form with a slightly higher density in one layer than another, and the dynamics are slow to equilibrate the, uh, the right number of liquid crystalline molecules in each domain. But it is possible to form the smectic from the top end. We almost never get the crystal because of the enforced quench rates that we have. Uh, it will form a glass much more readily. We are, we are effectively, no matter how uh, we heat the system, if we're doing this in a tractable amount of, of time steps, we use, um, excuse me, I was looking at another question that popped up in the chat window. Um, if, we, if we do that, we will end up with uh, a, essentially a, a glassy state. We, the, the, the system will almost always uh, cool much, much faster than even the slowest quench rate you would see in an experiment. And therefore, approaching the thermodynamic equilibrium crystal from above is a very difficult proposition. We can do something like that using the replicate exchange, but we have to kind of seed the crystal on one end and the uh, the smectic on the other. And that's sort of the, the, the system that we had. Okay. There are ways to get around that, but it was easier for us in this study to start with a crystalline-like object that had the right balance of layers and to warm it up from there. So I, I see a question I see yeah, in I the chat the window. Yeah, says, yeah, the question in the chat is, why you use uh, op opal S mm -hmm. or field? Instead, and not amber, amber. Uh, or something, <laughs> or something more easier, yep. you know. <laughs> yep, yep. That's a great question, by the way. I, I, uh, it also says, uh, what method, what computational methods do you use? Um, so we're using Gromax molecular dynamics for these simulations, and then post analysis with Python scripting. <laughs> we we uh, <laughs> we do scripting around uh, the analysis of the of the trajectories. The reason we use OPLS in the original set of uh, simulations, we actually use the generalized amber force field in the second set, is not because we are beholden to one particular force field over another, but actually because 
in the case of the OPLS force field, there was an existing force field that someone had parameterized to explicitly model the uh, CN MIM or excuse me, the CN MIM um, nitrate. And the only difference between what we did and what they did was we extended that alkyl tail out past eight. We went all the way out to 18 or 20, depending on the, the set of simulations we were doing. That method had been developed to be transferable. So we thought that was a great basis to start our investigations. It's not because we thought there was something better about OPLS than, than AMBER. Honestly, a force field is a force field. They're all wrong in some way. Um, that's probably not as controversial a take as it, as it seemed uh, 10 years ago the first time I said it to someone, but they're all wrong in, in some way, but some of them are useful. Um, and so that's why we used that. For these later studies with the CNMTFSI, we've been having to build novel molecules, and it's been much easier for us to do that using AMBER and the antechamber uh, system that, uh, that has been developed for implementing specific novel molecules. And so the generalized AMBER force field plus uh, plus antechamber has helped us get these novel molecules running. So we, we pick it based on uh, the ease of the tool set and the transferability we need for applications. There's something actually that also isn't in here. A good friend of mine uh, at uh, Purdue University, uh, Brett Savoy, has developed a set of um, tools to parameterize force fields automatically that he refers to as Taffy. He developed it originally, I think, as a postdoc, uh, and he's been developing it further in his group since then. And we've been exploring that using those ideas, getting bespoke force fields from this, this Taffy that can then be run in any MD framework. The benefits of that are that all of the parameter, parameters, bonds, torsions, angles, but also the Leonard-Jones parameters, are given their best fit properties from quantum calculations um, and, and then can be implemented. Okay. Great, there are another question. Uh, why do you use Gromax that is make it special? <laughs> I know it, that's it. Uh, I, uh, I knew how to use Gromax and when my students started doing this, I said, please use Gromax because if it breaks, I can probably fix it. Right. It, when something goes wrong, it's helpful to be able to debug. We're actually moving beyond specifically Gromax for the for the um, for the amoeba force field. We really need to use Tinker because that's the only place it's properly implemented and properly implemented with a GPU form that can be tractable. Uh, but the reason we use Gromax is 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 essentially that I knew how to use it coming out of my postdoc. So when I talked to the first student on this project about what do, what code do we want to use for this, uh, what code is a good all atom code that would be useful for this, we said, I said Gromax because I, I, I could help them along. Uh, as they developed more tools, they started using Tinker a little bit, they started using OpenMM a little bit, um, but that that's it. it. It's free and it's something I knew how to help debug. I, I wish it was deeper than that, but I, I don't, I don't really mind. I'm actually a huge proponent of using lamps, but I, I think that lamps can be very cumbersome. So some of you may know uh, the large scale atomic uh, molecular, I forget what the second M is, parallel simulator from the Sandia National Lab. Um, that's a great code. It's a great code because you can add features, add calculations, add things to it. I, I greatly even prefer it to Gromax personally but it can be very cumbersome for working with all atom models. And I think Gromax is a little bit better for working with all atom models. As it has some nice features uh, such as rigidity in, um, in uh, aromatic groups and things like that, that are not implemented quite as efficiently in, as in, in lamps. So yeah, that's it. There's nothing else special about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tool. I'm, I'm agree with you. So I have a last question. Uh, mm -hmm. I missed uh, if you that if, if you if in your simulations the mobility mm -hmm. of the ions is increased uh, actually. 
you know, you you show uh, first uh, a first experimentalized, I think, uh, plot in which in the desmetic phase the mobility of some oh, of yeah. the ions are, are increased in the desmetic. Oh phase yes, yes, yes. Compared so this, with, this the, is, with the crystalline. So, you're thinking of this this image, right? Yes, yes. This yes. is an experimental plot. Yeah, this this is a different system. Uh, but okay, what, what was your question then? Ah, my question is uh, if you observe this kind of, of behavior in your in your simulations. I, I missed a, li a little bit just. So Probably you we, mentioned it, but but I miss it. We we do. So if you it's not quite to this degree, and I can explain why this probably is a little optimistic relative to ion conductivity because it is proton conductivity. Um, uh, those of you familiar with growth use transport will realize that a proton does not have to meander its way through. It just has to bind on to the, the group in a site that it's sort of favorable temporarily for, and then it can just kind of pop along the way. But it still requires this, this pathway to go through. Like growth use transport does not occur through the aliphatic region. It can only occur through this chain of, of sort of hydrogen bonds that will occur in the ionic region. So this jump is due to the SMEC decay, but partially the, the degree to which it happens is due to the, uh, the character of what's being transported. But your question is, do we observe this? And the answer is kind of. So we have this, uh, it's not a conductivity, it's a mean square displacement, okay? It's a proxy for the conductivity. It's a lot easier to calculate, but when we do molecular simulations, if we're calculating uh, transport coefficients, we have the choice of doing green Kubo style integration or things that are like MSD. The conductivity green Kubo integration is very similar to integration of the velocity autocorrelation function. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's very close. The electrophoretic mobility of an ion is very similar to its just plain mobility. Since we're not applying a field, we can get an idea for how mobile these things are looking at this. So this is in the solid phase. This is right as it starts to transition to the smectic phase. This is in the smectic phase. And then this is in the isotropic phase. We don't have a jump that goes back down, but we do have a significant increase in the mobility of specifically the counter ion, the smaller ion, in the um, in the uh, um, smectic phase, right? There's there's a, a separation in the scales just approaching this, as we see that that there is a, a bit of melting of the ionic layer, but not melting of the full layer, and then an enhancement in the mobility of uh, the ionic layer. That, that's great, great, really. I, I think these results is very important. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, okay, thank you. Time. So thank you very much for the nice talk. And thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And, to, and to, to, if anyone has questions, feel free to uh, to shuttle them through me to, by email if there are, are things that, uh, that people would like to answer that we do not have time for. I'm always happy to talk to people. Sure, sure. I will share some questions if some people send to me. And... You and me, we need to talk. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We need, we need so, to talk soon and frequently. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for everyone.